Selina opened her mouth to object. She knew Cade was rejecting her explanation, but she was tired and she didn't want to think about it anymore. She turned off the light and lay down. Cade scooted over and wrapped her in his arms, spooning her. Ooh, FNAF spooning. <laughs> Selina forced herself to concentrate on Cade's familiar warmth, and she made herself ignore the frantic pace of his beating heart, which she could feel against her back. Even after Cade's heart rate slowed and he settled into sleep, Selina once again remi remained awake for a long time. The next couple of weeks passed relatively uneventfully. On several nights, Selina and Cade spent the evening with Janice. They helped her with chores and had dinner with her. If they weren't with Janice, Cade worked late. He worked so late that he missed dinner. He'd come home just before 10 or so. They'd have a cup of tea or hot chocolate, talk about their day and then go to bed. Both Selina and Cade were sleeping fitfully, but they were, but they were sleeping. Uh, if Cade was getting up during the night, Selina didn't hear him. The dark circles under his eyes, though, didn't go away. Selina kept herself busy during the day with both work and renovations. The first week after Cade told her about Lally, Selina threw herself into setting up her home office. She refinished the hardwood floor and painted the walls a mossy green. Hanging curtains in stripes of grey and the same green as the walls, she then went out and found the perfect rug, desk, credenza, a new set of filing cabinets. She hung her favourite prints on the walls, and she declared the office done. Once she was finished with the office, Selina demolished the half bath. It felt great to swing a sledgehammer over and over. Slamming heavy steel against porcelain tiles was deliciously cathartic. Sorry. Over the weekend after she destroyed the bathroom, Selina and Cade tiled the floor and installed a new toilet, vanity and sink. They worked from sunup to sundown both days. Was there something a little frenetic about the place? Probably, but neither of them mentioned it. After they finished the first were at the half bath, Selina turned into the eccentric painting lady. After they agreed on a pale taupe colour for the walls with white trim, she painted the entire main floor. When she was done, she and Cade went on a marathon furniture shopping spree purchasing an antique cherry dining room set, a navy blue sofa and love seat, a navy blue rug with a cream and top geometric pattern, an oak coffee table and two matching end tables, and a pair of antique brass lamps for the end tables. Selina found the perfect top and dark blue tweed drapes for the living room, and then she feverishly brought throw pillows and art. She spent several hours arranging and rearranging the furniture, finally setting on a configuration that put the sofa and love seat in the middle of the room. She positioned them so that they flanked the fireplace. The dining room and living room were done by the end of the month. The kitchen was going to require a professional, so they hadn't tackled that yet. However, with most of the main living areas complete, Selena decided it was time to have some people over. Cade had made many new friends on the job. On the Few nights he didn't work late, he and Selina were invited to several dinners so he and Selina could get to know Cade's new co-workers and their spouses. Between these people and the friends Selina was making on her walks and during her shopping trips, they were developing an enjoyable social network. Let's have the Petersons, the Taylors and the Lees over for dinner this weekend, Selina suggested one night as they cuddled on the sofa, sipping hot chocolate. We owe them all dinners. We owe them? Cade said. He grinned at Selina. Did I miss something? Did we sign a tit-for-tat tit contract when we had dinner at their houses? Selina lightly smacked his thigh. You know what I mean. Yes, I do, Miss Etiquette. Selina rolled her eyes. I'm thinking something casual. It's warm enough. We could barbecue. Sure, Kate said. He set down his mug and put his arm around Selina. That sounds fun. On nights like this, Selina could almost convince herself that everything was fine. She could almost forget about the trunk and about Lally. Almost. The night of the barbecue, they had perfect weather. It was warm and the sky was full of sparkling stars that looked like they had been hung over their heads, uh, like party decorations. After a feast of burgers, macaroni salad, green salad, chips and corn on the cob, followed by homemade brownies, Janice's recipe, Kate said they just tasted like his mom's, the four couples settled around the gas fire pit Selena had installed just days before their get-together. They all reclined on the plush navy and cream striped patio chairs they she'd brought the day before. How about charades? Selina asked. Grace Pe Peterson, a petite woman with short cropped blonde hair, popped out of her chair. 
I want to be on Hugh's team. She poked her husband, Ron, and made him change places with her. Ron, an unusually pale guy with long brown hair, rolled his eyes as he good... Uh, na na naturedly gave in to his wife's game of musical chairs. He noticed Selena's questioning look. Hugh is a film and literature buff, he explained. More like a trivia nut, Hugh's, Hugh Taylor's wife Teresa said. A tall, broad-shouldered, red-haired Teresa dwarfed her short, bald husband. But appearances aside, they appeared to be a perfect match. It was impossible to miss that they were crazy about each other. Selena grinned. Well, then I want to be on Hugh's team, too. Everyone laughed. Grace stood. I've got one. Hugh and Selena, and their other teammate, Ava Lee, an athletic brunette, looked up at her. When Grace made the universal sign for movie, Hugh winked at Selena and Ava. They grinned. When Grace made the u universal sign for movie, Hugh thought it was a fishing rod. Uh, no, never mind. Grace held up six fingers. Six words. Selena said unnecessarily. Grace held up one finger. First word, Ava said. Grace nodded, then she shook her head. She held up one finger again. Selena frowned, confused. Point? Hugh asked. He leaned towards Selena. The clue is the one finger. Point break! Selena shouted. Kate snorted out a laugh. That's just two words, sweetie. Selena blushed. Grace shook her head. She started lifting and lowering her arms as if she were flying. The birds... Selena blurted. She blushed deeper the second the words were out of her mouth. Then she laughed. Ignore me, I'm math challenged. Everyone else laughed too. Grace chewed on her lower lip. Then her eyes lit up. She bared her teeth and shifted her gaze to the far left. She looked deranged. Again, Selena shouted without thinking. The Shining was... She was pretty pleased with herself for realising Grace was mimicking the star actor's crazed expression in that movie. Everyone laughed. Well, The Shining is now canon to Five Nights at Freddy's, guys. Everyone call your moms. Um, Selena clapped her hand over her mouth. She shook her head, then dropped her hand and laughed too. I really can't count, can I? She looked over at Hugh. He smiled at her. Then he calmly said, One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Or cuckoo's nest. I've never heard of that before. Grace clapped and rushed over to give Hugh a high five. Selena shook her head. Sorry for being so dense. Ava laughed. It's the adrenaline. Who has time to count words? I almost said The Shining too. You just beat me to it. Selena was relieved that no one was making her feel stupid for blurting out two word answers to a six word clue. Ron stood and began acting out a clue for his team. They played three rounds of charades. He was wa wa eh. he was a walking trivia encyclopedia so he easily guessed whatever his teammates acted out. After the first round, Selena kept her mouth shut to avoid further embarrassment. <coughs> Oh, when I when I talk too much, I start to cough a lot. Give me one second. <coughs> okay, that's embarrassing. Oh, and I have also got low battery on my laptop. <laughs> right. Um, where was I? But her team sounded. Uh, but her team soundly beat Ron's team, which included Teresa, Cade, and Ava's husband Marshall. Finally, Ron threw up his hands. I give up. We need to play something else. He picked up his plastic mug and looked into it. Selena stood. Do you like another cream soda? Ron glanced at the big ice-filled bowl that held the canned drinks. I think I drank them all. Selena laughed. We have more out in the fridge in the garage. I'll go get some. Uh, you sure? Ron asked. I can drink something else. I don't want to be a bother. No bother, Selena assured him. Ava, tra <laughs> Ava tapped Marshall. Why don't you get your guitar from your from the car, sweetie? We can play Name That Tune. Hugh groaned. Ava winked at Selena. Music is the dark hole in Hugh's trivia verse. Selena grinned. I'm pretty good at coming up with song titles. Hurry back then, Ava said. We'll keep the same teams. Maybe you can carry Hugh. I'm hurrying, Selena said, chuckling. What a fun night, she thought, as she headed around the house to the garage. She was really glad she'd suggested it. Selena hadn't had much one-on-one -on -one time with Cade during the evening, but she'd been watching him. He'd been at ease, laughing and talking easily. He seemed like his old self. What a relief. Pushing open the back door to the garage, Selena flipped on a light. They'd run out of bulbs with the right wattage, and they'd have to substitute wimpy 60-watt bulbs in the overhead lights. The bulbs didn't throw enough light to brighten the whole garage. 
Most, uh, much of the space sat in pockets of dingy darkness. Selina went past the SUV in their new small red pickup. They'd driven it home the previous week. She strode toward the extra fridge tucked against the wall. The fridge was flanked by several stacks of boxes Cade hadn't had time to unpack yet. His workshop space was still waiting to be set up. Next to the boxes, the lawnmower, weed whacker, blower, bush trimmer, hoses, and a few other yard maintenance odds and ends were in a tangle that Cade promised he'd sort out soon. Next to this jumble, a shop vac, I don't know what that is, a shop vac sat on top of a metal workbench that Cade hadn't yet put into place. As Selina reached the fridge, her gaze skimmed over the shop vac. She started to open the fridge door. Her hand froze. She flicked her gaze back toward the shop vac. Selina's heart catapulted into her throat. She gasped. Next to the shop vac, a small white robot with black eyes stood upright. It was Lally. It had to be. It looked like the robot in the photos. The robot didn't move, but it was facing Selina. She felt like it was watching her. For several seconds, Selina was frozen. While her heartbeat galloped and invisible mites crawled along her arms, she stared at Lally in shock. When Lally remained motionless, Selina whipped open the fridge and grabbed a six-pack of cream soda. Letting the fridge door slam, she looked toward the shop back again. In the seconds it took her to open and close the fridge and look that way again, she debated whether she wished the robot would be gone or still be there. Which would be worse? The robot was still there. Selina turned and raced back through the garage. Uh, slamming the door behind her, she ran around the house, slowing her pace only when she was within view of her guests. Back near the gas fire pit, she handed a can of soda to Hugh and put the rest of the sodas in the bowl of ice. She casually walked over to Cade. Marshall was tuning up his guitar. Everyone else was chatting. Cade was having a conversation with Ava about some coding issue they were facing in the project they were working on together. Selina stepped up beside Cade and put her hand on his arm. She couldn't miss the fact that her hand was trembling. She looked at Ava. Sorry to interrupt, but I need to steal him for a moment. Cade raised an eyebrow in question. I, uh, need you in the garage a minute, honey, Selina told him. Everything okay? Cade asked. Uh, yeah, just... She gave Ava a tight smile. Sorry, I'll bring him right back. Ava smiled. No problem. She turned toward her husband. What is it? Cade asked as Selina grabbed his hand and pulled him toward the garage. Uh, she was trotting. She st he stumbled over a tree root. Then he, too, started jogging, picking up on her urgency. Selina hesitated at the garage door. Are you going to tell me what's wrong? Cade asked. Selina didn't answer him. She took a deep breath and opened the door. The garage lights were still on. She had left them on purposefully. She hadn't wanted to turn them off before she was out of the garage, not with that thing in there. The fact that it wasn't moving when she left had done very little to lower her panic level. Selina stepped into the garage and pointed toward the shop vac. Look, she said. After she spoke, she got up to do she got up to do the air. Eh, she got up the courage to do the same thing she was asking Kay to do. What am I looking at? Kate asked. Selina blinked at the empty spot on the workbench next to the shop vac. The robot was gone. It, 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 it was there, she said. What was there? Kate asked. Did a raccoon get in here? I shooed one away last week. Selina shook her head. She quickly scanned the garage. The robot wasn't in sight. But that didn't mean anything. The garage had way too many places to hide. Selina groaned. Now she was getting as paranoid as Kate was. Kate stepped in front of Selina. I'll ask again. What's going on? Selina looked up at him. She swallowed. I... I saw... I saw Lally. I mean, I think it was Lally. It was a white robot that looked exactly like the one in the picture, and... Where did you see him? Kate interrupted. Selina pointed. Next to the shop vac. Cade strode across the garage. He looked all around the workbench and behind the boxes on either side of the fridge. Then he turned and began searching the rest of the garage. Selina stood near the door, poised for reasons that had no foundation in logic, to run. Her mind was a tangle of incoherent thoughts. A funny white noise-like sound buzzed in her ears. What was going on here? Cade returned to Selina. A furrow bunched the skin between his brows. I didn't imagine it, Selina said. I didn't say you did, Cade said. But, Selina began. Cade took her hand. She didn't resist when he pulled her out of the garage and closed the door behind them. He, too, left the lights on. We have guests, Cade said. They're going to be wondering what we're doing. Selina nodded. He was right. Now wasn't the time to talk about what she'd seen. It wasn't the time to think about it either. 
They rounded the corner of the house, and Selena pa uh, pasted on her happy hostess smile. Sorry about that, she called out. A little rodent issue, Cade lied. Ooh, Cade lied. That's, that's chilling to the core. Uh, Selena noticed how natural the lie sounded, but she didn't take the time to think about that either. The day after the dinner party, Cade was now gone when Selena woke up. She found the note on his pillow. The note she knew immediately contained another lie. Sorry, got called into work. Love you. Cade never got called into work on a Saturday. He was merely avoiding her. He didn't want to talk about what had happened. Well, neither did she. She wanted to forget about it. Selena got up and looked outside. The day was bright, but she didn't feel like taking a walk. What did she feel like doing? The truth was that however much she wanted to forget what had happened, Selena was rattled by it. Really, really rattled. Selena got up, pulled on her dark blue terry cloth robe, and went down the hall. What she needed was a long, hot bath. As Selena shuffled toward the bathroom, she thought about the master suite they intended to have. They planned to knock out a wall and steal some space from the guest bedroom so they could create an ensuite bathroom for the master bedroom. They just discussed, a couple days before the get-together, whether to tackle that or the kitchen next. She was thinking the ensuite should come first. Selena went into the bathroom. She left the bathroom door open. She always left the bathroom door open when she took a bath, even when Cade was home. She didn't like steaming up the room. Turning on the tap at the end of the clawfoot tub under the window, Selena ran the water until it got hot. She adjusted the temperature, put in the drain plug, and poured some muscle-relaxing bath salts into the water. The bath salts were a combination of Epsom salts and geranium and juniper essential oils. Selena inhaled the scents of the oils and let them try to soothe her. They failed miserably, but she hoped the bath itself would do the trick. Because of the... Uh, sorry. Because the farmhouse sat at the front of their five acres and the acreage was thick with apple trees around the back of the house. Selena never worried about the about pulling the shade over the window above the tub. Their property was secluded and private. No one was around. Selena waited until the tub was half full. Then she dropped her robe and started to pull off her nightshirt. When it was almost over her head, she froze. She yanked the nightshirt back down. Someone was watching her. She was sure of it. Selena leaned toward the window and scanned the backyard. She squinted and looked toward the trees. Her gaze shot from one tree to the next. She didn't see anyone. Selina frowned. Even more rattled now than she had been before, she reached out and pulled the shade. Then she turned and closed the bathroom door. Selina's bath wasn't as relaxing as she'd hoped it would be. In fact, it was almost torturous. She tried several times to lean back and close her eyes, but she was too much on the alert. She kept thinking she could hear sounds coming from another part of the house. Once, she was sure she heard a creak in the attic overhead. Twice, she thought she heard footsteps on the stairs. Finally, just after 15 minutes, Selena gave up. She got out of the tub, drained it, and quickly put her robe on. Hurrying back to the bedroom, she dressed in jeans and a t-shirt. Then she went through the entire house, making sure she was alone. Selena checked every room and every closet. She even looked inside the awful trunk, which was now back in the rear of the closet in the third bedroom. It was still empty. After she assured herself that she was alone, Selena tried to work. It didn't do any good. She couldn't focus. She kept hearing sounds in the house. Once when the refrigerator's compressor kicked on, she practically leaped out of her chair. Work wasn't working. She was a knot of nerves. Selena abandoned her office. She grabbed her purse, went out to the pickup, and drove out of town. She spent the afternoon antique, antiquing, antiquing. I don't know how to say that word. It's, it's like antique, but antiquing. Anyway, coming home with a vintage skirt, an antique hall table, and a pair of hundred-year-old uh, hundred pewter candle holders, she tried to tell herself she imagined everything that had happened the night before and that morning. Over the next two weeks, though, it became abundantly clear that Selena hadn't imagined anything. She really was being watched. Either that, or she was losing her mind. Probably both. <laughs> no matter what Selena did when she was at home, she felt tingles between her shoulder blades. She could actually feel someone's, or something's, gaze boring into her. It wasn't just when she was alone, either. It happened when Cade was around, during the evenings, and on the weekends, too. After just a week of the unrelenting sensation of being observed constantly, Selina, 
lying awake during the night, decided that the cursory searches she'd done through the house, looking into every room and closet, weren't thorough enough. Selena's dad's wedding day advice burbled up and nudged at her. Trust your instincts. Her instincts told her that she needed to look in every nook and cranny of her house. When Cade left for work the next day, Selena made sure the house was locked up tight so nothing and no one could enter when she searched. Then she went through every tiny space in the house. She opened every cabinet and every drawer. She looked under every piece of furniture. She looked behind anything and everything that had more than an inch of space behind it. In the middle of this search though, in her bedroom, Selena stopped and sat down on the floor. She dropped her head into her hands. Who was she kidding? She wasn't being watched electronically. Not only was that totally unrealistic, it didn't fit the facts. Selena got off the floor. She went down to her office and closed the door behind her. She pulled the shade. She sat at her desk and opened her laptop. She brought up a new document. At the top of it, she typed facts. Then she typed the facts she knew it as she knew them. Lally was a robot. Number one, Lally was a robot that really existed. Number two, Lally went missing from Freddy's Pizza Plex. Number three, Cade saw Lally after it, not he, Selena refused to refer to Lally as he, went missing. Cade thought, or number four, Cade thought he trapped Lally in the trunk. Number five, Cade kept the trunk with him, locked up from that point on. Six, Selena unlocked the trunk. Number seven, when Cade opened the trunk, it was empty. Number eight, Selena saw Lally in the garage. Selena had taken a symbolic logic class in college. <laughs> oh god, we're going into logic class? Uh, it had been an elective chosen as a lark, but when she w what she learned came in handy now. She ran her facts through a logic equation and came up with two possible conclusions. Neither of them made her happy. One logical conclusion, based on the facts, was that Lally was real. And although not as easily proven, the corollo cor corollary to this conclusion was that Lally was watching Selena. This conclusion, however, was so insane, logical or not, that it led to the other possible conclusion, Selena was losing her mind. Figuring they would help her in the business world, Selena had also taken several psychology courses in college. In one of the courses, they studied paranoia. Paranoid people, suffering from delusions, were always convinced that their conclusions were logical. The problem, however, was that their conclusions were based on logical fallacies. Selena went back over her list of facts. Was she sure they were really facts? Or was she grasping at logic to cover up the real fact that she was becoming paranoid and delusional? Selena deleted the document and closed her laptop. Her hands were shaking. She couldn't stay in this house another second. Selena left her office. Ignoring the immediate awareness of being observed as she walked into the kitchen, she grabbed her purse and went out to the pickup. As she went, as she backed out of the garage, on the garage, sorry, she realised where she needed to go. Well, hello, dear, Janice said when she opened her door and saw Selina standing on the front porch. I'm sorry I didn't call first, but Janice waved away Selina's words. What did I tell you about calling and about knocking on the door? My home is your home. You can come and go as you please. Janice had given Selina a key to her house the day Selina and Cade married, and she had indeed told Selina to treat Janice's house as her own. Selina, however, hadn't been able to bring herself to do that. Besides, she was afraid that if she did so, Janice would assume the open door policy was reciprocal. Selina loved Janice, but she didn't want her mother-in-law dropping in unannounced. Janice, who was wearing a ruffled pastel pink apron over yellow polyester pants and a yellow and green floral patterned blouse, led Selina through the living room and into her large old-fashioned kitchen. Janice's leather flats tapped on the yellow and blue linoleum floor. In the kitchen, Selina inhaled deeply. The room smelled like butter and cinnamon and sugar. The scent was enticing. It almost made her forget why she was here. Janice gestured at the baking ingredients and pans scattered across her yellow formica countertops. I was just whipping up a batch of my raised cinnamon rolls for the ladies club, Janice said. Would you like to help? I'd love to, Selina said honestly. Maybe making cinnamon rolls was a better idea than having the conversation she wanted to have. Baking usually relaxed Selina. She hoped it would do so today. Selina went into the pantry and plucked a simple blue apron, no ruffles, from the, pack, uh, from the back of the pantry door. Janice had given the apron to Selina to use when they cooked together. Frills don't, just don't suit you, dear. You're far too beautiful to hide those elegant curves under flounces. 
For the next hour, Selena and Janice spread out dough and sprinkled it with butter, cinnamon and sugar. Then they'd rolled up the dough and cut it into classic cinnamon roll pinwheels. After the rolls were in the oven, Janice put water on for tea. Your usual peach spice, dear. Do you have any chamomile? I have no idea what that is, Selena asked. Oh my, Janice said. Do you need a de-stressor? You could say that. Janice didn't ask why Selena needed a de-stressor. Selena liked that about Janice. She never pried. Janice made the tea and she and Selena sat at Janice's round kitchen table. Selena toyed with a pale blue and yellow plaid place placemat as she let Janice chatter about her bridge club for a few minutes. But then Selena decided the conversation she came to have uh, she came to have couldn't be put off any longer. Speaking of games, Selena said in what she knew was a pathetic segudebe. <laughs> I have no idea what that says. Uh, what was it that Cade liked so much about Lally's game? Janice didn't seem to mind the abrupt subject change. Why, you know, I'm not sure. She took a su sip of tea. It's funny you ask. That's something I did wonder about at the time. At first, I thought it was the colours in the arena. He was he has never liked my softer colour palette. Selena thought about the rich burgundies, dark greens and deep blues that Cade liked to wear with his ubiqui ubiquitous Why are there so many weird words? Uh ubiquitous ka khakis, she nodded. But I decided that wasn't right. I think what it was, Janice leaned back in her chair. The game made him feel special, because the game was just for two. And Lally was a robot. I think Cade felt like he was the chosen child or something. <laughs> um, now, heaven only knows why he needed that feeling. As an only child, he got nothing but tons of attention from me and his dad. Until his dad passed, of course. Rest his soul, she shook her head. But maybe that was part of it. He was an only child. Maybe he wanted a brother. Maybe Laddie was like a brother to him. I'm really not sure. I do know that Cade would. I do know that Cade didn't want to share Laddie with anyone. What do you mean? Selena asked. Oh, I'm just remembering how upset Cade got one day when another little boy, a boy he knew from school named Daniel, snuck into the game. My oh my, was Cade angry. He was furious. His little face was all screwed up and red when he got home that day. This game is only for two, he said to me over and over. You would have thought that Daniel had done something unforgivably egregious instead of just the relatively benign action of spe sneaking into Lally's game with Cade. Um, Janice sighed. Daniel was a sweet little boy, adorable freckles across his nose. I knew his mother. It was so tragic that he died in a horrible accident. Selena set down her teacup so fast it rattled in the saucer. Janice didn't notice. What accident? Janice got up and walked over to the oven. He turned on the oven light and bent... Sorry, she turned over the oven, oven light. Oh my gosh, this is really difficult to read. She turned on the oven light and bent over to look through the glass window set in the oven door. Oh, they're rising nicely. You're really getting a hang of kneading, dear. An accident? Selena tried to get Janice back on track. Janice acted like she didn't hear the question. Maybe she didn't. Selena had noticed that Janice tended to drift in and out of conversations at will, as if sometimes she had better things to think about than whatever was being talked about. Selena tried a different question. Why did Cade like Lally so much? I think Lally is kind of scary looking, Janice supplied. Selena raised her eyebrows. Yeah, I tend to agree, Janice said. But then, little boys are odd creatures. Cade also liked snails and slugs when he was small. He was always poking at them with sticks. Not to hurt them, mind you. He just wanted to see what they'd do. He thought they were fascinating. Selena smiled at the image of Cade poking at a slug. Then her mind replaced the image of Cade and the slug with one of Lally. Selena shivered. How did Lally work, exactly? Selena asked. Was it programmed to run and hide, or to sneak up on the kids, or what? Selena wanted to understand how the robot could be doing what it was doing in her house. She was nearly 100% sure now that Lally was her stalker. Oh no, nothing like that, dear, Janice said. Lally didn't move. The kids had to carry him around and hide him themselves. 
seemed somewhat silly to me. Of course, if you hid the thing, you'd know where it was. But it was all a grand game of pretend, I guess. Selina blinked at Janice. She opened her mouth to ask another question, but no words came out. What else was there to ask? Selina knew what she needed to know. Wiping her suddenly moist eyes with a trembling hand, Selina stood. I have to get home and get some work done, she lied. <clears throat> it's getting interesting. Joking. Uh, if Janice thought it odd that Selina practically ran out of the house and leaped into the pickup, Janice kept her reaction hidden. She smiled and waved as Selina drove away. Selina managed a twitchy wave in return. She couldn't summon up a smile. Her hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly that they started to ache, Selina burned rubber as she accelerated away from Janice's home. She ignored the posted speed limit. Although her eyes were on the road, she really wasn't seeing it until her gaze flicked over an oncoming SUV. A very familiar SUV. It was Cade. Selina looked straight ahead as she passed her husband. Had he seen her? Cade often got tunnel vision when he drove. Maybe he hadn't noticed. Uh, the pickup. The bright red pickup. Selina glanced in the rearview mirror. The SUV turned off, heading toward Janice's house. So what if Cade did see her? Maybe Selina was overreacting. Maybe she only thought she knew what was going on and... Again, maybe she was leaping to logical conclusions that weren't logical at all. A ripple of something that felt like static electricity skittered down Selina's spine. Was it groundless anxiety or was it thoroughly justified fear? Selina didn't know. All she knew was that she wanted to get away. Would she be fleeing from Lally or from Cade? Or would she be fleeing from herself? It didn't matter. She was fleeing. Back in the farmhouse, Selina ran down the hall to the attic door. Hesitating for only a couple of seconds, she flung open the door and trotted up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, she quickly pulled the string to turn on the bare bulb. She looked around. The attic looked the same as it had the last several times that she checked it. Rushing across the open space, Selina grabbed two suitcases, the two largest. She pulled them across the attic. Their rubber wheels made scuffling noises against the buckled floorboards. Selina shoved the suitcases out of the attic, onto the landing at the top of the stairs. Then she dragged the cases down the stairs. The skr thump skr thump skr thump of their progress down the stairs made her cringe. At the bottom of the stairs, Selina shoved the suitcases into the hall. She turned and closed the door behind her. She pulled the suitcases down the hall to the bedroom. Selina hadn't allowed herself to sense anything since she left Janice's home. She didn't think she could function if she let herself feel. When Selina lifted the suitcases onto the bed, though, her emotions demanded that she acknowledge them. She started crying. Stop it, Selina chastised herself. She wiped her eyes. She needed to focus. Selina rushed to the bureau and began pulling out her clothes. She tried to think clearly enough to grab only what she really needed. Other than packing and getting out of the house, she had no clear plan in mind. How could she? She wasn't reasoning. She was reacting. Selina finished with the bureau and started toward the closet. She was reaching for the door handle when she heard a thud downstairs. She froze. Holding her breath, Selina listened. She just started to breathe again when the thud was followed by a rustling sound, which wasn't far away. Selina turned and stared at the open bedroom door. Why hadn't she closed it? Abandoning her packing job, Selina crossed the open doorway. She looked down the hallway. It was empty. A single tap came from the stairs leading down to the first floor. Selina glanced back into the bedroom. Should she ignore the sounds and just keep packing? No. No way. If she wasn't here alone, she wanted to know about it. Selina tiptoed down the stairs. She craned her neck to examine the whole flight. It was empty. Selina looked around. Okay, she'd do this systematically. Starting with the empty bedroom, Selina began her search. She first opened the closet and checked the trunk. It was empty, of course. Selina moved on to the bedroom they'd intended to turn into a spare room. It now had a bed, but the bed wasn't made up and they hadn't added any other furniture. Selina got down on her knees and looked under the bed. Nothing. She stood and went to the closet. Selina had put the lesser used part of her wardrobe in this closet. She had too many clothes. She knew that. But she loved clothes. She'd put most of her vintage finds in this closet. Throwing open the closed door, or the closet door, sorry, she pushed back the long dresses and skirts. Nothing was behind them. The only thing on the floor of the closet was a couple dozen pairs of Selina's shoes, the ones that didn't fit in the master bedroom closet. On the shelf above the clothes, hat boxes containing the hats she rarely wore were stacked almost to the ceiling. Selina left the guest room. She opened the linen closet. It, too, held only what, was, what it was supposed to hold. 
Stacks of towels and sheets and bales of, po of toilet paper and paper towels filled the closet's shelves. Selina closed the closet door. Selina already knew nothing was in her bedroom. She'd just been in there. She'd also just checked the attic. She had to go downstairs. Selina walked slowly to the top of the staircase. She listened. Two clicks and a rattle came from the direction of the kitchen. Selina steeled herself. She stepped as lightly as she could onto the first step. Doing her best to avoid the creaky spots on the stairs, Selina crept down to the living room. There, she paused. A faint scratching sound came from the dining room. She headed that way. They had yet to fill the hutch that had come with the cherry dining room set. Uh, its upper display cabinets were empty. Selina hurried over to the hutch and opened its bottom cabinets. They were empty too. The dining room was separated from the kitchen by pocket doors. They were tucked back so the doorway was open. Selina stepped through it and surveyed the kitchen. It was deserted. She crossed the pantry. She opened the door and, locked, uh, sorry, and looked at the shelves full of canned and boxed foods and baking supplies and small kitchen appliances. She felt her tears trying to return. She'd had so much fun organising the pantry, but that had been before. A rasp came b from the living room. It sounded like something was being dragged. Selina grabbed a rolling pin from the nearest pantry shelf. She ran into the living room, the rolling pin cocked over her shoulder. The living room was empty. Selina lowered the rolling pin. Now what? She'd searched the whole house. She looked up the stairs, thinking about her abandoned packing job. Was she overreacting? Selina walked over to the sofa and sat down. She laid the rolling pin on the seat next to her. She leaned against the soft sofa back and picked up a torp and cream striped throw pillow. She hugged the pillow. Was she just being paranoid? Was she about to blow up her marriage, her very new marriage, for no good reason? Selina remembered her brother's wedding day advice. Don't screw it up. Was she screwing it up? Something rustled behind the sofa. Selina scrabbled for the rolling pin as she started to turn. Before Selina could get a grip on the rolling pin or see what was behind her, a hand clamped over her mouth. Selina's heart kicked into overdrive. She tried to scream, but the hand stifled the noise. Selina flailed for the rolling pin. The back of her head knocked against it, and it rolled off the sofa. It hit the rug with a thunk. Shh, Cade said. Selina twisted her neck so she could look up and behind her. Cade was leaning over the back of the sofa. Had he been hiding behind there? Why? What was he doing? Had it been him making all those sounds? Again? Why? Selina goggled at her husband. Cade put his finger over his lips. His gaze, intense, almost deranged, darted all around the room. Selina stared into the face of the man she'd loved for over two years. It was a face she thought she knew better than her own, and the man was someone she knew that well too. She'd planned to spend her life with him. He was like an extension of her. Now she barely recognised him. Yes, Cade still had the thick black hair and brows, the green eyes, the sculpted cheeks shadowed by his black whiskers as usual. He still had the wide mouth and the even white teeth. But all those features now looked distorted somehow. They looked like they'd been infected, tinged by something dark and menacing. Selina tried to wrench her head away from Cade's hand. He pulled her tighter against the back of the sofa, turning her head so she couldn't see him anymore. She felt the pressure of his head against the top of hers. If you upset Lally, Cade whispered, you'll end up in the trunk next. Selina felt the bottom drug. Uh, Selina felt the bottom drop out of her stomach. What? So the bottom of what? Selina felt the bottom drop out of her stomach. That feels like a typo. I don't really know how to understand that. She struggled to suck in air through her nose, which was partially covered by Cade's hot, hard palm. Cade's breath was sour. He'd never had breath like that before. She'd smelled his morning breath and his garlic breath and his peanut butter breath, but this was acrid, as if he was in e air exhaling whatever poison he'd kept hidden inside for many, many years. Promise you won't scream if I take my hand away, Cade whispered. His whisper was so quiet that Selina could barely make out the words. His warm, repulsive breath puffed into her ear. Selina nodded several times. Why bother screaming? No one but Cade would hear her anyway. Promise? Cade whispered. Selina nodded again. Cade took his hand away from Selina's mouth. She turned and opened her mouth. Cade made another shushing gesture. He leaned even closer to her. Don't speak. You really don't want to upset Lally, Cade whispered. Selina used every ounce of willpower she had to keep her expression blank. She didn't move or make a sound. 
Cade hurried around the sofa and sat down next to Selina. She didn't look at him again. She couldn't. She stared straight ahead, and she stayed silent. Inside her mind, however, Selina was screaming her head off. She was tearing toward the door. She was coming to grips with the only logical conclusion presented by the facts. Her husband was insane. Selina looked toward the entryway. Could she make it to the front door before Cade caught her? She glanced at Cade. He cocked his head at her. Then he, too, looked toward the front door. He shook his head slowly, once. He returned to, the sca to scanning the room. Cade was sitting close enough to Selina that she could feel the heat of his muscled thigh against hers. She was so familiar with the solid feel of him, but now the pressure against her own leg felt foreign, invasive. You killed Daniel, didn't you? Selina whispered. She didn't know she was going to ask the question until it was out of her mouth. She hadn't let herself consciously think about the conclusion she'd reached when Janice had told her about the boy who had died, but clearly Selina had known. Why else had she raced home to pack? Why else had she planned to leave the man she loved? Cade turned to stare at her. She sh he shook his head. No, he whispered. He shook his head again. It was Lally. He turned and looked behind them. He craned his neck to look up the stairs. He shook his head a third time. The game is only for two. Prickles of terror cascaded throughout Selina's nervous system. Her throat closed and she fought to breathe. Somehow, though, she was able to keep her expression tranquil. Selina dropped her gaze, looking for the rolling pin. Her shoulders slumped. The rolling pin had spun over the rug when it hit. It was now under the coffee table. Selina would never be able to reach it before Cade reacted. Turning toward Cade, Selina tried to look loving and concerned. Knowing what Lally did must have been terrible for you, she whispered. Cade looked at Selina as if he had no idea what she was talking about. She tamped down her revulsion and touched Cade's forearm. Cade, honey, if Lally's in here, we need to leave. Why don't we leave? Cade frowned. He turned and looked toward the front door. He shook his head. Selina didn't think. She just acted. Leaping off the sofa, Selina lunged for the brass lamp on the nearest end table. She yanked its cord free of the plug set in the floor. Cade started to stand and reach for Selina, but before he could, she gripped the lamp by its neck, crunching its drum shade. Then she swung the lamp like a baseball bat. She bashed its base against the side of Cade's head. Cade staggered back, then fell into the coffee table. He hit his temple on the table, and he was limp when he slumped to the floor. Selina didn't wait to see if Cade would move. She dropped the lamp and took off. Because Cade's body blocked Selina's path to the front door, she started toward the kitchen. She hadn't taken two steps, though, when she saw a hint of white out of the corner of her eye. Selina whipped her gaze toward it. As she did... Cade moaned and shifted. Selina lost her ability to reason. She turned and galloped up the stairs. At the top of the stairs, Selina realised she'd been an idiot. She should have tried to make it to the back door. Now, though, she was on the second floor. Up here, she had no way out of the house unless she wanted to leap from a second floor window. She glanced back down the stairs. She heard Cade groan again. No, she couldn't risk going down there again. She looked down the hall. Where could she hide? A scuffling sound came from the living room. Selina ran down the hall. When she reached the guest bedroom door, she dashed into the room. She charged toward the closet, flung it open, and dove into the veil of her vintage clothes. She turned and pulled the closet door closed. Wait, did I... Oh, never mind. It might not have been the best hiding place in the world, but the familiarity of Selena's things gave her comfort. She, sh she could draw on that comfort to help her think about her next step. Right now, she didn't know what to do next. She knew she couldn't hide in here forever, of course. The house wasn't that big. If Cade searched for her, he'd eventually find her. Maybe before then, though, she'd come up with a plan. Selina crouched behind the old dresses. Her breathing was so loud in the cramped darkness that it sounded like she was sharing the space with a pack of pan panting dogs. Selina gulped air for several seconds. She had to quiet down. She couldn't listen for Cade if all she could hear were her own billowing inhal inhalations. Inhalations, like an inhaling. Selina pulled herself into a tight little ball. She stared into the darkness, pressing in around her. Although a trickle of light reached into the closet from under the door, it was only enough to give the clothes that shielded Selina a ghostly presence. Selina stared at the dim, floating shapes and tried to steady her breathing. Selina was starting to get control of herself when the clothing draped around her swished. And then a whisper came out of the darkness. The whisper's message was short, but it was filled with meaning. Hi. 
Selena screamed louder than she'd ever screamed in her life. Cade's consciousness swam in blackness. His thoughts were blanketed by the murk. Through this mental nothingness, however, sound reached him. He heard the echo of piercing screams. Then the curtain of oblivion muffled his hearing too. He was aware of nothing at all. Cade lifted his head. He groaned. It felt like a construction crew was pounding nails inside his skull. Putting a hand to his head, Cade winced. He felt a knot near his temple. Trying to sit up, Cade blinked to focus. The room spun. He was suddenly nauseous. He stopped moving and just sat, his back to the sofa. Cade tried to find a coherent thought. His mind felt sluggish, mushy. What was he doing on the floor? Cade tried to remember. Selina! Cade struggled to his feet. The room spun again, but he managed to stay upright. How long had he been out? He looked at his watch. Too long. The fog in his brain cleared abruptly. Selina! Cade called out. Cade's chest constricted. He tore out of the living room. Racing through the dining room, Cade burst into the kitchen. He sprinted toward the pantry and flung the door open. It was empty. Barreling out of the kitchen, Cade hurried down the hall towards Selina's office. He looked into the room. When he didn't see her, he ran to the half bath. She wasn't there either. Cade returned to the living room. He checked the coat closet. He found nothing but coats and boots. Cade pelted toward the stairs. He took two steps at a time and was in the upstairs hallway in sec seconds. He rushed down the hall, throwing open doors as he went. He looked into the bathroom and in the bedroom. He checked the master closet. Cade dashed and bent back into the hallway. He started toward the guest room. Then he stopped. No, he whispered. Cade turned and looked toward the closed door of the third bedroom. The door was just a door, but it suddenly seemed to pulse in a rhythm that matched Cade's rapid heart rate. Cade took a step toward the door. He wavered and steadied himself. He took another step. Finally, he forced himself to move normally again. He ran to the door. Cade's hand slipped off the knob when he tried to grasp it. His palms were sweating. He wiped them on his khakis and grabbed the, knot and grabbed the knob again. He turned it. Cade charged into the empty room. Not bothering to look around, Cade sped directly to the closet. Throwing the door open, he tossed aside the blankets piled on the trunk. He dropped to his knees in front of it. Cade gripped the trunk's lid. Taking a deep breath, Cade opened the trunk. No! Cade cried out. Cade felt his face contort in horror. Tears filled his eyes. He clapped a hand over his mouth so he wouldn't be sick. He wanted to look away from the grisly contents of the trunk, but he couldn't. As he continued to stare into the trunk, Cade's shoulders convulsed, his chest heaved. Finally, he couldn't look any longer. He fell back. He dropped his head into his hands. Cade's head whipped up, though, when a whisper came from above the trunk. It came from the empty shelf above the hanging rod in the closet. The whisper contained five familiar words. The game is only for two. The hissed words drifted down to Cade like the spray of a toxic mist. They engulfed him and then they left him in silence. Cade reached the top of his staircase leading to the attic in his new house. He set down the stack of three boxes he'd lugged up the stairs. He looked across the attic at his beautiful fiance. How could he have gone so lucky? He hit the jackpot again. Debbie was gorgeous. Blonde, blue-eyed, petite, and as sweet as she was stunning. Debbie was any man's dream. And for Cade, she was a reality. Hey babe, Debbie said. This is the coolest, isn't it? I've never had an attic before. Cade smiled. He loved Debbie's enthusiasm for life. Above them, rain pattered on the attic roof. The gentle tapping was soothing. So was the dark, cloudy sky that hung low over the house like a grey shawl. Cade and Debbie were moving into their new home, a big old Victorian on the outskirts of the city. They'd gotten to the house. They'd gotten the house for a song because they... What? They'd gotten the house for a song because it needed a lot of work. But Cade didn't mind. He liked a fixer-upper. Cade walked over to Debbie and wrapped his arms around her slight, sh slight shoulders. Yes. It's the coolest. Like you. Debbie laughed. She tilted her head back and kissed the dimple on Cade's chin. Stepping out of his embrace, she looked around the room. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to finish this attic, Debbie said. 
They will make an incredible art studio. She crossed the big octagonal window at the east end of the attic. She threw her arms out and then spun in a circle. When the sun's out, this window is going to let in some amazing light. An incredible art studio for an incredible artist, Kate said. Debbie laughed. She returned to Cade. You're the one who's incredible. Head programmer for the biggest tech company in the state. Hard to beat that. Cade gave Debbie an aw oh, shucks look, but he didn't disagree. His new job was going to be great. He, could, he still couldn't believe he'd landed it. He couldn't wait to get started. He'd have to move away from his mum to take the job, but she hadn't been upset about that. Janice had assured him she'd be fine. It was sweet of you to move back to be close to me, sweetie, she'd said. I loved having you nearby, but now, now I think you need to move on. And I'm perfectly capable of taking care of myself. Debbie stepped away from Cade and started shifting boxes around. She set one box on top of a stack of two. Then she cocked her head and looked behind the stack. Hey, I've never seen this trunk before, Debbie said. What's in this old thing? Cade crossed to Debbie and put his arm around her narrow waist. Oh, he said. It's just some childhood baggage. Cade steered Debbie toward the attic door. I'm ready for a break, babe. Aren't you? Let's go down and have some of that lemonade the new neighbour left for us. What was her name? Something old-fashioned. Debbie smiled. Winifred. That's it, Cade, Cade said. Cade ushered Debbie out of the attic and turned back to flip off the light. Hesitating, half listening to Debbie chatter about an aunt who had the old-fashioned name of Octavia, Cade looked at the trunk. The battered old chest seemed to peer back at Cade, at Cade as he gazed at it. Cade turned off the light. He closed the attic door. <laughs> oh wait, that's not the end. Thunder rumbled as the skies darkened even more. The attic was swathed in sombre shadows. Nothing but blackness could be seen in the vast space until two small pinpoints of light peeked up over the top of the old trunk. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. I love it. It's so good. The twist ending is magical. It is so well done. So, so good. Uh, it's like, it's basically the new kid done well, I think. Uh, I think there were a few problems with the new kid, but I think this story is amazing for that twist ending. So good. Um, I kind of wish we saw more of Lally and Lally had like a better kind of uh, thing. You know, like she didn't, or Lally, sorry, he, it's a he pronoun. Uh, he didn't really have much of a of of a th of a play in this story, I guess. Like, I wish he kind of had more of a haunting kind of aspect to it. Uh, I don't know. Like, obviously, uh, Selena was really paranoid and stuff, but I feel like um, Lally could have come in more. Anyway, really, really cool. Really, really cool stuff. Um, I, I don't really have much to say other than I'm going to have an explanation video for this full story uh, out very soon. Hopefully this week. Uh, there it seems to be like a shadow, like kind of in the Fazbear Frights. Uh, the twist ending is so cool if you don't know what happened. Basically, I believe this is this is one of those stories where, you know, it's implied that this happens over and over again to multiple different people. I don't know if Cade is, you know, hypnotized into doing this, you know, like brainwashed by Lally or something. Or if this is actually Cade and his motivation, uh, like, to, to just, I don't know, kill people. I don't know, but this is really cool. I wonder if it has any connections to the box. Tell me what you guys think in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.